alumnos de la Universidad Autónoma de Zacatecas, tenemos la dicha de contar con nosotros como visita al doctor David Gross, ganador del Premio Nobel de Física en el año 2004, y platicaremos con él para conocer un poco más de su vida y de su trabajo. Profesor Gross, ¿de niño siempre se sintió usted inclinado hacia la ciencia o hubo un evento particular que lo inspiró a seguir una carrera científica? Uh, I got interested in science uh, the age of 12, 13, mostly by reading um, popular science books that were describing the wonderful discoveries that were being made in astronomy and physics. And I, was always I was always good at math and enjoyed doing mathematical puzzles, but uh, I realized that, you know, these great physicists could figure out how the world works using mathematics as a language, and that would seem to me much more interesting than doing puzzles. And uh, so I think I decided very early uh, to be a theoretical physicist, although I, I'm not sure I knew what that really meant. But I wanted to just use my mind to try to understand the universe. Um, I remember one book, an especially popular book, No Equations, beautiful book by Albert Einstein and Infa, which was given to me. And uh, Einstein became a real hero to me. Now I feel he's more like a colleague. <laughs> Well, that's an excellent part about science there. Same people that inspired you, yeah. um, they get to be colleagues for you. So. Right. Well, you realize that they too make mistakes. Einstein was uh, one of the greatest physicists, but also he made mistakes. So it's important to understand that everyone is human. Perfect. ¿Qué lo llevó a realizar sus estudios de licenciatura en la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén? Well, I was living in Israel. My father moved to Israel, uh, went there as an advisor to the government for some years. And so I went to the Hebrew University um, and did my undergraduate degree there. Um, and that well, was very interesting, some very good professors, especially in mathematics, but also in physics. Very una vez que tuvo su grado de licenciatura, ¿qué lo llevó a dirigirse a la Universidad de California en Berkeley? Yes. Well, I, I applied to many places. Berkeley, which I ended up in, was very special at that time because it had the largest particle accelerator in the world. And it was, it was clear to me already then that Uh, elementary particle physics was what I wanted to do. That was the frontier of physics. And um, so Berkeley was a very exciting place because of the biggest accelerator in the world. The LHC nowadays at CERN is a thousand times bigger. But at that time, Experimenters were discovering new particles every few weeks. It was enormously exciting place to be. I had very good professors. And uh, also California was a wonderful place to be. And Berkeley in the 60s was especially interesting. Excellent. ¿Cómo se involucró en el estudio de la fuerza nuclear fuerte? How did you get involved in the study of the nuclear force? Well, um, the challenges for elementary particle physics at that time were the nucleus and what goes on inside the nucleus. But by that time, it was understood there were really two different kinds of forces in play. One was the, we now call the weak or electroweak interaction, which is not a strong force. It is the In modern terms, the force that is responsible for radioactivity, which we understand now as the fact that one 
up quark can turn into a down quark, emitting also an electron and a neutrino. Because of that, neutrons, for example, are not stable. They live only a few minutes, they decay to protons and an electron and an antineutrino. But that force was weak and well understood by a kind of an approximate model, which had worked pretty well. It really was deficient, it wasn't so good. Uh, and explanation came also at the same time, about 10 years later. But the force that was completely mysterious was the strong nuclear force that held the protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. And uh, the, all these new particles that were being created were somehow due to this force. And nobody had any good theoretical ideas. It was that was enormously exciting. Lots of data, no understanding. That's a perfect area for an ambitious young scientist to explore. Because it's clear that nobody knows what the answer is, so it's open territory. Excellent. Aquí no vamos a meternos de lleno a hablar de qué consiste la cromodinámica cuántica para que lo puedan hacer. Los invitamos a que vean su conferencia en, en la página del Museo de Ciencias, pero nos gustaría saber cómo se sintió cuando se dio cuenta que tenía una teoría que ayudaba a explicar la interacción nuclear fuerte. Bueno, well, it was, as I, it was very surprising. I've been trying to understand the experimental results from the Stanford Linear Accelerator that suggested that the part the constituents of the proton were moving freely at short distances and that they looked like quarks, which made no sense because quarks had to interact strongly, otherwise you could easily knock them out of the proton. And couldn't find an explanation in quantum field theory, which was the basic theoretical framework we had to understand relativistic quantum mechanics. So I uh, really wanted to show that, uh, that there was no explanation. If you took the experiment seriously, quantum field theory could not explain this, and you had to look elsewhere. And in the end, we discovered the only quantum field theory that could explain this phenomenon. That was, to me, was a surprise. And, uh, but even more amazing was once it, it was clear that this kind of theory, a generalization of Maxwell's theory of electricity and magnetism, with three kinds of charges, the colors we call them of the quark, that that could work in explaining the slack experiments, it could also lead, it led us immediately to a theory, the only consistent theory that could explain that phenomenon and was consistent with everything else, more or less, that we knew about the strong force. So it was totally amazing. Wow! Suddenly, I was surprised and then um, astonished. And there were puzzles because We didn't really have an explanation of how quarks can't get out. It seemed that because the force was getting stronger at large distances, maybe they couldn't get out. But uh, that has never been proved, but it's certainly true. We know from calculations within the theory, we know from experiment, no quarks have ever been seen. But it's still a hard problem. But on the other hand, because the forces were weak at short distances, we could immediately start to calculate. And theoretical physicists love to calculate. Why? Well, it's fun to calculate things that might agree with nature. And then it's even funner, more fun, to 
tell experimentalists, make predictions. If you measure this, you'll find this number. So you can test your ideas. So we started immediately to calculate. And, uh, and also to try to figure out how is it really, how are the quarks really confined? A problem which we don't yet totally understand in depth. It'll probably take, QCD is 50 years old this year. It might take another 50 years. Perfect. Una vez que publicó su teoría, ¿qué tan preocupante o complicado es esperar a que los experimentos la confirmen? Especially in the case of QCD. So there's a story about Dirac. Dirac famously uh, discovered the Dirac equation, which describes um, the quantum mechanics of a, an electron, which has a spin, it's a rotating electric charge, creates a magnetic moment, because it's spinning, anyway. Dirac discovered this beautiful equation, the Dirac equation, and predicted that there must exist an anti-electron, positron, which was discovered a few years later. Great triumph of his theory. But the first thing he had to do after this discovery was to see what the spectrum of hydrogen would be in his theory. Hydrogen was well explained by the Bohr model, the precursor to quantum mechanics in 1913, but the relativistic version of that had slightly different effects, slightly relativistic corrections, and it was incumbent on Dirac to see what his equation would give. He, in the end, solved the equation which agreed with the experiment, precisely, but it took him a month to do that. And somebody asked him once, why did it take you a month? It's not that hard an equation to solve. He said, I was scared. Such a beautiful equation. It had to be right. <laughs> but he could test it. And he was a little scared that his test might not agree with the experiment. So he couldn't do, he had to wait till, okay, I'll just do it. Luckily for him, or for us, it turned out to be an exact agreement with measurement. So in our case, uh, well, the calculations of, we make, could make a lot of predictions because uh, there were Force is not exactly zero, it only becomes zero. When it's not zero, you can do the calculation quite precisely. But the experiments hadn't been done with that precision. And it took really almost 30 years, 20 years, for those experiments to be done with enough precision to really test these ideas. The effects we found are small, but uh, the variation with distance of this force or the energy is logarithmic. And logarithms are very slowly varying functions. So it took a long time, and uh, and you know sometimes experiments are wrong, and they can be. You have to. So it was you know, not an easy journey. It became easier and easier as time went on and more and more experiments were done. But within a few years, it was clear it had to be right. But, you know, theorists are not the judge. Nature is the judge. So we had to wait for nature to really give a strong credit. But nowadays, no one have any feeling that it, it's not right. There's so many, literally hundreds and hundreds of very high precision experiments have been done, 
and calculations up and down. We can calculate the mass of the proton, the neutron, and all the other particles that have been produced. So it's clearly correct. But you have to wait for nature to say so. It's not enough just for it to be a beautiful equation. ¿Cuándo se dio cuenta que ganar un premio Nobel era una opción real? Well, it was, uh, from the beginning it was clear this was a big deal. Uh, there were many problems, uh, many of them theoretical problems that were resolved. But again, it took a long time for nature. And you know, the other thing is, of course, Nobel Prizes are tricky. If you look at the history of Nobel Prizes, you'll see that roughly for every theorist who won a Nobel Prize, there are three experimenters who win Nobel The Nobel Committee is made up mostly of experimenters. Physics is an experimental science. Most physicists do experiments. Maybe a quarter do theory. And when you do make an experimental discovery, you see a new particle. And somebody else afterwards confirms that with an independent experiment. Well, there it is. You've seen, observed, discovered something in nature. There's no question that you made a discovery, which is what Nobel Prizes are given for. Now, it could be that you don't understand what that is. Rankin, the first Nobel Prize, was for x-rays. He had no idea what x-rays were at all. But it was clear that he had discovered something important you could see inside your body. So he won the first Nobel Prize very quickly. For theory, the uh, Nobel Prize committees are very conservative. They're not going to give a prize until there's overwhelming experimental evidence that that theory is correct. So in our case, it took uh, 30 years. A few years ago, there was a prize for the Higgs particle that had been predicted 50 years before it was discovered, experimentally, in agreement with the theory. A few years ago, there was a Nobel Prize for the discovery of gravity, gravitational waves, waves of space-time, of Einstein's theory of gravity which Einstein had predicted a hundred years before. <laughs> Einstein wasn't around to get the Nobel Prize, another Nobel Prize for gravity waves, but it took a hundred years. ¿Cómo le cambió la vida al ganar el premio Nobel? Sorry? How did winning the Nobel Prize change your life? Well, winning the Nobel Prize is somewhat like you know, walking into a hurricane. <laughs> Suddenly, every balloon went. It's crazy. It's, uh, it, it's, you know, on the one hand, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a great honor. A lot of upper doors open, upper, lots of opportunities. On the other hand, a lot of demands on your time. So in some sense, it's good that it take, took 30 years. <laughs> so that by the time the prize came along, 20 years ago, uh, it was less crucial than I think. But it certainly took a lot of my time away from physics. So you could, if they gave the prize very early on, it would be bad for physics. <laughs> Me parece asombroso. ¿Cómo es capaz de abordar temas de física muy complejos con un público no especializado, desde niños pequeños hasta personas de cualquier edad? ¿Siempre se le ha facilitado eso o, o lo ha trabajado para lograrlo? Well, I just, you know, I, I've now, especially in the last 20 years, I've, well, first of all, I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, I teach. I enjoy teaching. At any level of teaching, you have to, you have to, um, explain things at the level of the people you're teaching and bring them up to you, to uh, our current understanding. But I've had a lot of experience the last 20 years, even more, uh, in 
talking to uh, audiences, lay audiences, if you want, that don't understand, well, the jargon. Normally, scientists talk with all sorts of jargon and funny names that physicists understand, but people don't. So you have to translate things into ordinary English. And, and the other thing, of course, is that one of the biggest problems that scientific communicators have, um, and in general, society has, is the numeracy. The language of science, especially of physics, is mathematical. Galileo told us that. The language of, math of, of physics is mathematical. So uh, all of our descriptions of experiments, our modeling of experiments, our theories are highly mathematical. And in fact, they get more and more mathematical as time goes on. The kind of physics that I do today, the speculative physics that's at the frontiers of knowledge, uses mathematics that was invented in the last 50 years. And it uses mathematics that I never studied as a student, and after I now study it in order to follow and contribute. So it becomes more and more mathematical. And on the other hand, um, unfortunately, it seems to me that our education throughout the world is becoming less and less mathematical. And there's more and more what, we, what I call innumeracy. So we then face the difficulty of explaining physics, like QCD, you know, quantum, relativistic quantum mechanics, physics, which requires a lot of mathematics to really explain, uh, without using mathematics. That's extremely difficult, and, and at some level can't be done at all. At some level can be done, but it's not easy. I sort of uh, um, picture it as trying to explain to someone who has been deaf from birth, uh, Bach's sonata. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult without knowing the language. And uh, it's even true of one, you know, I am a member of very learned societies which have scientists and have historians and have poets. And the non scientists are terrified of anything that might actually use as an equation. There, there's fear of mathematics that pervades even the universities. That, uh, and that's very unfortunate. So one has to try very hard and to learn how to try to explain things that can't really be explained, but you can get some approximation without mathematics. It's not easy. ¿Qué tan importante considera que la ciencia se acerque a, a público de niños y jóvenes. Young yeah. people, young kids. Exactly. Young students. Well, you know, well, scientists are quite aware that the education of the young people is essential for the progress of science. I mean, it is true that most, not all, a good portion of the big advances are made when uh, one is very young. So, I, this Nobel Prize winning work that I was involved in, I was 30, 31. My graduate student was 22. But, uh, and this is commonplace, of course. But, um, so we need scientific talent, and a big part of it. The life of a scientist is teaching, that's how we get paid, and, uh, and mentoring the young scientists because, you know, at some level, graduate school usually, uh, scientists, the, the young, a young scientist is real at the stage of learning to become a scientist. 
be learning not just what is known in textbooks, but how to find out what isn't known yet, rather than just questions but no answers. And we don't, you know, that there's no set of rules or prescriptions. You can't open a book and say, this is how you become a creative scientist. You learn that by observing other people and working with them by mentoring, sort of like apprenticeship, the way we teach a person to be a carpenter. He works with a master carpenter. Like a craft. That's a craft. And creativity and scientific judgment are things that are learned best by mentoring. And, uh, but of course, so that's important to mentor young talent. It's also very important to have young people with fresh ideas and who question the prevailing ideas. So it's great to see, as we just saw with the court group, all these young minds who are curious and ask questions and they haven't, their curiosity hasn't yet been killed. It's been preserved and, and promoted. That's wonderful. And uh, it's a very important part of the scientific culture and scientific life. Hablando justo de eso, me gustaría saber que, un poco más de lo que opina del trabajo que hace el Grupo Quark y el Museo de Ciencias con los niños aquí en Zacatecas. Well, I'm really amazed. Uh, I met you some few years ago and you described it to me, but now I see it in action. And it's truly remarkable. I mean, uh, I haven't seen anything like it because you've created uh, you know, an enormous You've reached out to an enormous group of young children and got them enthusiastic about uh, exploring their curiosity about the real world and giving them the opportunity to learn about various areas of science. But you've also created a, a very affirmative culture of support from the young kids of five, six through I don't know where you stop, but <laughs> forever. Uh, and it, so it's a community of, you know, one of the great things about science, and I try when I talk to young high school students or undergraduates, try to uh, convince them not to do, uh, especially in Asia, what their mothers want them to do, which is become a doctor, uh, a medical doctor. <laughs> Of the going to real science because it, it's a wonderful community. It's a community of people who have a shared intellectual interest, a curiosity. And that community exists throughout the world. And if you become part of that community, uh, you have friends everywhere throughout the world who share your curiosity, your interest, who understand you. Who So it's a great life in that way, the culture of community of scientists. And you're creating that starting at a very young level. It's very impressive. Uh, so I congratulate you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Finalmente, le quisiéramos pedir un mensaje para niños jóvenes y el público zacatecano respecto a la importancia de mantenerse cercanos a la ciencia. So I'm speaking mostly to the kids. Uh, you're given, you have here in Zacateras an incredible group of people who are uh, volunteering to, to welcome you to the world of science, where you can explore nature and find answers to the questions that you've always wanted to know the answers to. How the world works, why the sky is blue, how, how many stars are there in the universe and what are they made of? So, I, uh, all I can say is you're lucky to have this opportunity with the Science Museum and the Cork Group and all these wonderful efforts. 
to explore some of these questions at a very young age and to, if you find it enjoyable and exciting, to continue to become a, a scientist yourself and explore nature and lead the most exciting kind of life you could possibly live. Good luck. Muchas gracias, profesor. Thank you so much. Pleasure.